Hello, and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed, or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good morning. Hey, if you are new, we are really glad you're here. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here. So glad that all of you are worshiping with us. And I want to wish happy Mother's Day to everyone out there, all you moms out there. Just so thankful for you and for uh, not only what you're doing in your family, but for what you do in our world and just... Um, glad that today we get to celebrate you. And at the same time, I just want to also just acknowledge that for some people, Mother's Day is kind of a mixed bag. There's kind of some hurt from maybe some past things that just kind of rise up in people, some disappointment or whatever. I just want you to know that for you as well, our heart is with you. And so uh, we're excited ab- about today and for to celebrate with you. And also, our, our, again, our, our grieving with those who are grieving or struggling today. We just love all of you. My mom is here today. I think on Mother's Day, if your mom is here and you're on the stage, you don't say anything. I mean, like, that's big trouble. She would love to talk to you, not because of anything particularly about you, but she just loves to talk. And uh, she'd love to talk to you. She would love to tell you all sorts of embarrassing stories, I'm sure. So if you're thinking, man, I wish I knew a hot three or four embarrassing stories about him that she's she's right there and in fact would love to talk to you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. She's, she raised, raised, she raised her hand. Raise her hand. Thanks, Mom. If you're joining us online, we're also glad that you guys are here as well. And we are in the middle of a series. Uh, we're talking through some of the miracles of Jesus. And kind of the way we've been structuring it is it's kind of thinking it in terms of stories. And in all my intros, if you've been here, um, I kind of talk about different types of movies and TV shows that I like. And eventually, I'm just going to use enough examples. You're going to think, this brother doesn't do anything other than watch TV and movies. Like, I've lived a long life, and I do like it. It's a good hobby of mine. So anyways, one of my favorite genres is the is like the prequel, the prequel movies or the prequel show or the origin story. Like, you learn about somebody, you get invested in something. Hey, here's what happened before that happened. It's really cool. And as someone who grew up on Star Wars... Like was like I mean I was a kid going to see the original trilogy in the theater during its first run. Uh, Loved that story. I and I think thought that you know after that incredible you know seven year run there the first three movies that like we we weren't going to ever get any more Star Wars and so when those prequels came out I was incredibly excited. I think. uh, I think Maley had just been. I think it was ninety seven. Anyways, it was ninety seven ninety eight somewhere in there. Uh, 25, 26 years old, so excited. And it's not because you don't know what's going to happen. Spoiler alert, Star Wars is 40 years old, right? No, no problem, right? You don't, you're not confused that Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader. You know that going into it. And so the first time you meet Anakin, you're like, oh, that kid's cute. I wonder what's going to happen to him. You're not confused about that. Or the actor that played the Emperor in the original trilogy... I mean, he didn't have anything going on. They just hired him back. And so his character, he's just like a senator. And he's like, huh, that's an interesting character. I wonder what's going to be. You know exactly what's going to You know exactly what's going to happen to these people. But at the same time, it is incredibly fascinating to just watch the story of how it unfolded. And there's a particular another genre of kind of movies and, and TV shows that I like where they kind of start with the ending and then they go back. I mean, there's one movie, Memento, which is really cool. It starts, it actually goes backwards chronologically. It starts, it starts here and works its way backwards where you're like, you know exactly what happens at the beginning. You're like, how did that happen? And um, shows like that are incredibly fascinating. And so in this particular story that we're looking at today, spoiler alert, we're talking about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And if you're familiar with that story, if I said, hey, we're going to talk about Jesus and Lazarus today, you probably already knew that. And um, if you didn't, now you already know. I have already spoiled it for you. We are about to see Jesus do, uh, I would say, I don't say, I don't even know it's already, like it is the, the most powerful, incredible miracle that he does to raise Lazarus from the dead. 
And it is one of the things that it, it, kind of, it kind of shook up the whole movement to the point to where Lazarus in later life, they're, they're, the, the people who are enemies of Jesus are looking to kill him as well because of what an, an incredible testimony he is to the power and position of who Jesus Christ is. So this is this incredible, powerful story. And just that moment, just the moment in which Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that by itself... That's an incredible story with an incredible sermon, with an incredible lesson to learn about who God is and His power. But knowing that that happens, to then go back and see what Jesus was up to, what He was doing, and why He was doing it in the days before and right up leading into that moment, you go back and you reread, it's like, it's, it's incredible what we will learn about who Jesus is. And about who Jesus is when we're going through a struggle like Lazarus' family is going through. And so we're going we're gonna to structure it a little bit different this way. We're just going to start with the end. We're going to start with the end of the powerful miracle that Jesus does uh, for Lazarus and his family. And then knowing that, go back to see and look at some critical decisions that Jesus made and some attitude that he shows and, and what we can then learn about Jesus from that. So... Start here, the very end of the story, John chapter 11, starting in verse 38. So he's having these kind of real emotional interactions with uh, Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha. And verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. If you grew up in Sunday school, grew up going to church, you probably heard this story once, twice, 10, 15 times. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty well-known story. And I think what often can happen with, and you've heard me probably heard me say this before, what can happen with well-known stories is they, they, become, they become a little too common. But I hope if we can just kind of take a moment and just imagine what was going on here, that we can kind of recapture the power and, the, and just the, what the people were feeling in that moment. As his sister said to Jesus, he has been dead for four days. And they are clearly still grieving. People are crying and weeping. And, and, and in fact, someone's going to, at some point, somebody says, like, man, this guy could heal the sick. If he'd been here, I could have avoided this whole thing. And so there's confusion. There's frustration. There's a lot of weeping and sadness and just grieving going on everywhere. And so Jesus, who in the minds of the people there could have done something about this, says, take me to him. Roll that stone away. He's like, man, he's been dead four days. It's already going to smell terrible. We cannot do that. It's like, God is going to show up. I told you that was going to happen. And then he stands and does this prayer that is reminiscent of youth pastor prayers all over. He's praying to God, but he just straight up says he's praying for the people, uh, for the people who are listening, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about with the youth pastor prayer, here's your youth pastor prayer. God, please help these kids be quiet. They're just disturbing everything. I might have to tell their parents. And um, they're going to be in real trouble, and they're not going to want that. Amen. <laughs> right, so he's like, hey, God, thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying this because they need to know. They need to know what is about to happen. This is not something that I'm doing. This is about our connection that you, God, the Father, has sent me. And then he says, Lazarus, come out of there. I mean, what are you... What are you feeling? Jesus is praying this really kind of big prayer. And then he yells at a dead man's tomb at the corpse to walk out. Okay, this dude is 
crazy. And then you go, but what if? And then that dude walks out with the, with the, with the bandages and the grave clothes and all the things we, we had just put on him. He just walked out of there. And whatever it is you thought Jesus was, whoever you thought he was, a good teacher, a man who can do miracles, a prophet from God, and whatever it is you maybe thought of God, creator of the universe, who's done some good things for us or whatever, who watches over us, whatever it is you thought of Jesus, whatever it is you thought of God, leveled up in an overwhelming way in that moment. And I can only imagine a mixture of excitement An overwhelming fear hits you when you see a dead man walk out of his tomb just because this guy, Jesus, said, get out. But what Jesus said, he said, this is why I'm doing it. I am doing this so that they can see, that they can see the glory of God and they can see, God, that you sent me and that you and I have this connection. And ultimately, it's because he wants us to understand this, that Jesus has The power over death. We've seen him have power over sickness. We have seen him have power over a demon. We have seen him have the ability to multiply food and to care for people. But this is something completely different. He is the master of death. Death is... Is that, that's it, right? We, the way that we talk about it, it is inevitable. It's something that happens to everybody. It is final. It is the conqueror. It is the greatest of all the enemies. You can stave it off, but you can't avoid it. And we can, we can, we, there's so many different things in our lives and so many different types of tragedies that through insurance plans and good scheming and healthy living and good strategies, you can avoid some of the things out there, but that is the one constant that we all know. Death is final. And then Jesus comes out and says, it is in fact not final. And we say this at church. We say this is a very Christian thing to say. Death is not the end. Jesus has power over death. We say that. They saw it. They saw that Jesus has power over death. And I can only imagine how many hours, days, or years it took them to fully process this idea. That the idea of resurrection, the idea of life after death, the idea that death is not the end. Even though it does come for us all, we can now know that it is not the end. How how do you get there? And they they had the ability to see it. The disciples, several of Jesus' followers beyond that, got to see the same thing happen to Jesus, for him to walk out of the grave and to walk around after death. There are a lot of people that got to firsthand experience that. And you read the book of Acts, and you see that it radically transformed their lives. And while we may not get to see it the way that they did, I hope that it will move beyond just something that we say in church, but that we will genuinely believe that the God of the universe, His Son, Jesus Christ, has the power to conquer death. Now, this is the point in which, you know, when you talk about the power that Jesus has to kind of overcome you know, death and overcome all these things. He's supposed to give all these qualifiers. People say, well, you know, you know this, you know that. I mean, what's, I mean, everybody is eventually going to die. And most of the good stuff is going to happen in heaven later. And we give all these sorts of qualifiers to the point to where what we believe are the qualifiers. And we don't let the real message of this really sink in deeply before we ask the question. Okay, well, if that's the case then how and why does the world still work the way that it does? And again, I think the answers are in what happens before. But let us never, let us not waver from this powerful idea that death is not the end, that Jesus has conquered death. It is one thing to say as a prophet, as a teacher, that you have the power to overcome death. It's another thing to ask a guy to walk out of his grave and he does it. And it's another thing to walk out of your same grave a couple of years later. 
And that's who Jesus Christ is. But we do. We do have to wrestle with the real world nature of this. Now, we know that he has this power. He has it. But life still seems to be what it is. And death still seems to be what it is. Why and how? What does this mean? Well, let's just kind of go back here. The very first part of John chapter 11, Jesus is actually in a completely different part of the country, not just in a different town, a completely different part of the country. And he is there with his disciples and his, his Lazarus' sister, Martha, Ma- Martha and Mary, you get from all different stories in the Gospels, you get they, they were obviously very, very close friends. And they seem to be both personal, spiritual and financial supporters of what Jesus was doing. And so they knew where Jesus was, and so they sent a, me- they sent a message to him, right? Verse 3, John chapter 11. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Very interesting thing, even just even just kind of notice right here. It's like, hey, this isn't going to end in death. And you're like, hmm. But it did. No, but didn't, right? He, he, Lazarus did die, but didn't end in death. It didn't end there. And, um, and he says specifically, let me tell you one of the main reasons why this is happening. One of the main reasons why this is happening is because God's glory is going to shine through it. Both in what happens and then, and then what Jesus does afterwards. Both in the, the suffering and in the redeeming of the suffering, in the, in, in the resurrection. Like, in all parts of it, we're going to see God's glory and all of it. That's why this happened. He's saying to the disciples, I cannot even imagine, begin to think, they think what is this dude talking about? I, just, I, I really wonder, like, how many times, like, the, these 12 guys were kind of standing around and Jesus would be saying something and be like, mm-hmm. Just like, just like we all do in church, right? Somebody says, that, mm-hmm. You know what he's talking about? Shh, no, shh. Right? Like, like, what, like so, no, 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 now catch this part, verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, fra- that kind of phrasing there? Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. He loved them. He loved them. So when he heard this news, he stayed where he was two more days. There's a huge disconnect there somewhere. I mean, there's a huge disconnect. Somebody sends you news that a friend of yours is sick and you're friends with the family and you know that they are grieving and you know that you are Jesus and you know that you can heal them and one more, we learn this in the other Gospels. He's got, I'm just going to sound like I'm being silly, but he's got long distance healing powers. He's got long, he doesn't need to be there. He has a guy come up to him and is like, hey, my, my servant's sick. And he's like, okay, I'll come with you. He's like, man, I know you don't, you don't need to come with me. You're very busy. If you'll just say it, I know it'll be done. So he long distance heals this Roman guy's servant. He doesn't need to go there to heal him. He could heal him where he was. He, he knows that they're grieving. He could go there, but he doesn't. He loved them, so he stayed two more days. And in a very real sense, now this is not always the case in every situation, so I'm not trying to make a broad principle out of this. I'll make the broad principle in a second. But in a real sense, Jesus let this happen. He let this happen to Lazarus. He could have done something about it. And it's not in just some big ethereal God is in control of everything sort of way. seems like it was a very, at least in this instance, it was a very deliberate choice on his part to let it unfold the way that it did. So he is the conqueror of death. He has, he has, he has, he has the power over death. He, but he often, often... Jesus often delays showing us that power, very often. Now, I don't want to say always. I don't want to say always. Because there are times where we need the miracle right now and someone who has some sort of deathly illness and, and you see a miraculous healing. This happens where he shows us his power to 
delay and stave off death and we see his healing power. We see it. Sometimes we see it in the moment. And in the moment that we see it, when we pray a powerful prayer, we see God's hand move immediately. And I don't want anything that I say to, to make you feel like that that does not happen and that it is not worth to pray to see the power and the hand of God move right in a moment. But very often, especially as we are talking about death, the power that we see is going to come much, much later. In fact, it is going to come in the next life entirely. But what we see here, what we see here in him showing that he has the power right now, it gives us the hope in this moment to know that at some point we will get to see that Jesus is a conqueror of death as well. We will get to see it, but it is delayed. For them, it was a few days. For us, it is going to be a few years. And if we just start thinking about life in general and the struggles that we have and the grief that we go through, this is off, very often what we see. We are suffering in some way and we reach out to God and, and, and the delay of His power, it's real. And it being Mother's Day, this is the, the story that came to my mind. And I guess it's Mother's Day and we're talking about origin stories. And it's just been, I've met quite a few new people and some different things and some travels over the last couple of weeks. And they were asking about our family and they asked about Layla and that we adopted her and people asking of her origin story. And so some of you were there for it. Some of you probably heard some parts of it. But after our first two daughters were born, um, we really genuinely believed, we believed that God had wanted us to have more kids. And we never went back on any form of birth control, just believing that God wanted to fill our family even more. A year goes by, two years go by, and nothing's happening. And we're starting to feel it. Every year it starts to feel a little bit more. Three years go by, four years go by. And I'm, and I'm watching my wife specifically really just kind of deeply grieve this. Me and my own different brand of coping mechanisms, I'm like, well, I mean, mate. Maybe we misunderstood. I'm, I'm shoving it. I'm shoving the grief down. Maybe we just misunderstood. Maybe this can just be okay, kind of how it is. And she's deeply grieving. I'm pretending that I'm not. And meanwhile, every Christmas, we have this Christmas decoration that taunts us every year. Something that Heidi's mom had given to us, a little snowman, a little happy little snowman with five mittens with a name on each mitten. Charlie, Heidi, Maylee, Lauren, blank. Every year. Five years, six years, seven years, eight years, nine years. A lot of confusion. Heidi begins to think, maybe we should adopt. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And I think apart from me, like at the time, it was a protection from more grief. That just sounds like something else that could go wrong. And for a while, she was asking me, and I, was, I, was, I wasn't on board. And finally, God did this really cool thing at this church that we had just moved to in central Arkansas. They were doing this big foster care orphan adoption deal. And it just, it really got me. It's like, I'm in. And then all of a sudden, everything reversed. Like, it, was, it wasn't very, it wasn't real to Heidi as long as I was not on board. Now I was on board and she's like, whoa, whoa. This was 2006. Four and a half years go by. We're here in February of 2011 hosting a call event at the Grove, which is where they're encouraging Christians to get more involved in adoption and foster care. It's important to me that you will know that it is February of 2011 because it was November of 2011, nine months later, nine months, we're talking about a baby here, nine months later after this moment where we say, well, we just go ahead and sign up. We're not really committing to anything. Let's just do it. And so as an act of faith and kind of cautiousness, we signed up for this. And God did a really cool work in my heart, did one in Heidi's heart. And over the, you know, and again, on another part of Northwest Arkansas, something else is happening in February of 2011, where two troubled people are connecting with one another and a, and a baby is conceived. And November 6, 2011, over 11 years after the birth of Lauren, a baby is born in Washington region. We don't know about it. DHS calls us on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we get the meter. And there's this incredible moment. She's in the NICU. 
And Heidi and I are able to go in, but our daughters who are with us, they can't. And so they Lion King, this little bitty six pound bean, right, up into the deal. And she's, she's covered in this kind of fuzz, which is a great moment for us as a family when Lauren, who was 11 at the time, goes, whoo, kids are going to need bangs. <laughs> so they Lion King her up in that window, and then Heidi and I are able to go in and just kind of get to meet her and love her. And then 11 years, it didn't matter anymore. It didn't matter. And it has become a real anchor point for me in my life. Every twist and turn and tragedy that has happened in my life, none of them mattered anymore. I've talked about this before. I've got fired from a job. I got, I got, there was a job that I wanted that I didn't get. I had all these struggles in seminary. I went to this job in St. Louis. I got fired. All these bad things that have happened, every one of now them is perfect and glorious because it was the essential step that was needed to get me and my family into this moment. And every, every, every moment of tragedy and grief of trying to figure out what God was doing over the last 11 years is redeemed in a moment because God prepared this one it was delayed way longer than I wanted it to be, way longer than any of us wanted to be. And God was doing something in us as a family. And God was preparing something for us that we couldn't imagine. And sometimes we have stories and they're a year old. They're 10 years old. Some of us are going to have 20-year-old stories, 50-year-old stories. Sometimes, very often, the hand and the power and the love of God shows up late and it may not be until the end. But this Jesus has power to overcome death. He can overcome all of it. And we trust in the power and we let God do a work in us in the delay that again, sometimes it's intentional. He did on purpose. He let this happen because what he wanted us to see, he wanted us to see this. And then he wanted us to share this. He wanted other people to experience this, to know that the hand of God is with you. He has power, but sometimes we wait. And so he goes. He goes to Judea. And he's interacting some with the sisters. Hey, you know that Lazarus is going to be raised, right? Right? And then she gives a great, beautiful theological answer. I know that in the last day that he will be raised, which for her at that time, first century Israel, and the depth of kind of what God had revealed to kind of about the way that, that, that death and resurrection are going to work, is actually a very incredible profession of faith. She had clearly been listening deeply to Jesus in ways that maybe other people had not. And so she's, she's hearing this, she's experiencing this, and he's like, no, 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 I, I mean, like, do you believe I can do this right now? And you can just feel the skepticism. And people are hurting or people are grieving. Verse 33, John chapter 11. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, the Lord replied. They, Let's come and see, Lord, they replied. So he's seeing all of this grief and all this hurt. It's like, where is Lazarus? So we'll show you. Verse 35. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? For those of you who are long-standing church people like I was going to church as a kid and you went to a church where it was important that you should memorize scripture and that was kind of a value. John 11, 35, man, it is the, it's the verse of little smart aleck kids all over the world telling their parents and Sunday school teachers that I've memorized verse. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. it's two words. So a lot of people know that verse, short verse. Some people may even know that it comes from this story. But I wonder if you notice its placement in this story. Jesus is experiencing the grief of Lazarus' sisters. He's experienced the grief of his friends, the extended family, the friends of friends, the people who were there and had been there for at least four days, grieving with them, still weeping and crying over this. And Jesus sees all of this and he starts crying with them. 
Now think about this for a second. We are 60 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, somewhere in there, a minute, two minutes max, away from Lazarus walking out of that tomb. And Jesus knew it. And he cried. Because here's the deal. He dealt and delay showing us that he is always, he is always with you in the pain. He's always with you. He could have given them all the perspective in the world that they needed. Well, you know that death is not the end. You know that he is in a better place. Or the, 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 the immediate perspective. Hey guys, don't cry. I'm about to bring him out of here. He had, quote, no good reason to cry. They had no good reason to cry because he knew what was about to happen. He knew that. He knew what was about to happen. He, he knew that life, that he was about to bring Lazarus back from the dead. So do not let for one moment someone tell you why you are grieving. Don't let somebody feel like they have to give you perspective to say, you know, it doesn't even make any sense why you're grieving because of this truth or this truth or this fact or this belief. Jesus had all of that and more. And again, a few seconds away from the most powerful miracle that he performs. But because they were hurting, because he loved them, he wept with them. I want you to believe deeply that Jesus Christ has the power to conquer everything, most especially death. And sometimes we are not going to see his power the way that we want, when we want it. Sometimes it is going to be weeks, months, years, decades away before we are going to experience the full power that Jesus Christ has over life and death. But for every minute of that, I want you to believe that Jesus' heart is fully with you. And he will weep with you when people who we think are way smart tell us there's no good reason to. Because he loves you. And he looks with you with that same compassion, that same love. And one day, even if it is not in this life, one day, the healing power of Jesus Christ, we will all get to see it. Let me pray. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.